Oh, oh, TC. Hey, that's that's cool. cool. You got a podcast? Well, I I didn't didn't know know that. That's cool. How you do? Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are back. Oh, that's cool. OTC's very own podcast and all the amazing people we work with right here at Ozarks Technical Community College. I, of course, am Jared Durden, and with me as always is Andrew Crocker. And I tell you something, even though we've been meeting in the summer, it's been a really fascinating summer for my field, as always, every summer seems to be fascinating. It's been busy. Very busy. One of the biggest stories of the past 50 years happened this summer. We had an episode with Oki where it got dropped, but I want to talk to you for a moment because, believe it or not, though physics isn't always in the news, it has been in the last week. With the how how closely have you been tracking James Webb, the James Webb Telescope? Oh, uh, fairly. I've been keeping up with the images as they post them. It's, and... it's got a little physics. What are your takeaways from it? Because I don't think many of the people who listen to this have a physics <laughs> expert they can just chat with about this stuff. So when you look at those images, pulling from your expertise. What are your thoughts? What are your takeaways from it? One important thing to recognize is is what it is you're seeing. And those photographs aren't limited to the visible light spectrum, which is part of the power of the James Webb Telescope. It's not the first to do this, but uh, the level which it's able to detect infrared as well as is so they've they've kind of they're representing through kind of a, a color spectrum infrared light as well, which is what's allowing them to look back so far. And remember, light travels at this constant speed of three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, which means it takes time to get from one place to another. And those light particles are what our eyes receive. Our eyes are the sensors for that electromagnetic wave that allow us to create those images. So what that means is we're looking back into the past, right? And this is a farthest back with the most clarity that we've ever, we've ever been able to see. And, and they're having a ball. I'm not a, an astrophysicist. Um, and so there's a lot going on that uh, I think astrophysicists are a lot more clear on and, and really, really excited about. Is this the, the, the temper I get? Dumb guy question, because I know you are a physics guy, not an astrophysics guy. How different are those to it's the just, lay person? I mean, it's so for it's, it's you being a um, your understanding of the Missouri Constitution versus the U.S. Constitution. It's 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 specificity and focus, right? What what you spend your time on, right? Uh, you're you're good at what you're good at because you spend time doing that. And there's such a broad range of of it's a big universe, and that's what physics is, right? Studying the actual physical universe, and so you 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 can't know everything, and 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 the more time you spend in a subject, the more the more you understand it. I've been reading about it and um, fascinated by it. One of the interesting things was what you just mentioned is that we're not seeing distance. I suppose we are seeing distance, but we're also we're seeing this weird amalgamation of distance and space and time yeah. because the starlights we're seeing are, uh, would you call them fossil records? Somebody compared it to digging down into the earth. Absolutely. When you're digging down into the earth. You're actually digging into, if you dig far enough, you're digging into history That's right. and you can kind of discern things about history from what you're digging. And what we're kind of doing with this telescope is digging into the farthest reaches of observable space. There's this other complication to our model of the universe that space itself flows. So not only are, are so we exist in space, whatever that is, right? So and we talk about it as this fabric um, that is is malleable, right? That stretches when when you put mass on it. But that fabric is also expanding and stretching outward, which means the space itself that we sit in is moving and stretching outwards right and and so that adds to that idea of of when we look back we have to also account for that when we make those calculations of how far in time are we actually looking back but this is also how they make estimates with how old the universe is um, which ranges in estimates between 13.5 and 15 billion years old and so we're looking just to that cusp almost now with the James Webb is where we're getting to. Is you know, it's funny. Somebody has, um, uh, somebody had mentioned, an expert who had written an article had mentioned that uh, this thing won't get us to the Big Bang. We haven't been able to see back to the Big Bang yet. Yet is the word he used. And I was like rubbing my palms together. I was like, that's, that's exciting is that there is a yet that ostensibly that's something that's visible that we can see at some point. It's always a yet, right? Yeah. 
Um, that on top of that, nothing, nothing has job security like science because there's <laughs> there's always uh, questions always lead to new questions. Right? The, maybe the most fascinating thing of this whole experience to me as a lay person is the fact that the people who know better on this subject have said the universe, the universe is the galaxies that we're finding seem to be made of nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen, the, the same building blocks that our universe and the universes we see so far are made out of. And that is, that does mean that anything we could ostensibly discover on those universes will be weird and different, but they'll be the same basic building blocks that there isn't some complete upside down multiverse. I mean, there might be a multiverse, but there's no upside down bizarre reality where just everything is like paint or something for some reason. It's all going to be built on the same building blocks and the stuff that we find, maybe even intelligent life at some point. You got to figure there's life out there, but intelligent life is going to be coming from the same building blocks as well. Someone smarter than me said there are two possibilities and they are equally horrifying. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. That both of those, yeah. Right? It was, it was Stephen Hawking who said, if there is intelligent life, just be happy it hasn't visited us yet because that's Christopher Columbus coming over the horizon, right? Yeah. And we are, you know, the, uh, the, the subjugated or the soon-to-be subjugated. I'm the same. I get all those. How many doomsday scenarios do you fear? I don't fear nuclear. But I fear AI. I fear intelligent life coming over well, the horizon. Well, we grew up with Terminator, right? Like yes. Skynet That's right. really imp- impressionable on our generation. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I fear a lot of doomsday scenarios. Um, yeah. Uh, I see them. The planet burning to a crisp? Well, I mean, ha- have we ever lived in a time where there wasn't one? That seems to be human nature, right? I think a lot of times it just comes down to we get bored. And wouldn't it be exciting if instead of going to work, I was, you know, strapping on furs and yeah. running through the plains? That's what I, This is coming from a guy, from a man who's homesteading. You do not rely on the modern society like the rest of us do. You are ready if the lights go out across the planet. You are set. You are ready to go. Uh, I don't know if ready is, but I'm willing. (laughs) But I think this would be a good time to bring your guest on because we have another scientist with us today that could actually help me uh, talk about something um, that would that would be related. Um, We have uh, with us um, from the physical science department, uh, Patrick Casey. Welcome to the program. Hello. Hey, welcome aboard. So yes, thanks for having me. Tell us first, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this question because I want to come back to this idea of what other forms of life might look like in the universe and I'll need some help um, from your expertise. But tell us a little bit about yourself and your relationship to the college. Uh, yeah, I'm Patrick Casey. I've been teaching chemistry here for almost 13 years. I started in 2009 um, and was brought on uh, by Lisa Reese at the time and I taught adjunct chemistry. God bless her. Yeah, we and we I I loved we service. Yeah, she, she was a great boss, first boss I had. It was it was uh, fantastic and very supportive. Um, and I got set up down at the Richwood Valley and Branson campuses for the first couple of years before getting brought up here to Springfield to teach majors level. I kind of teach uh, the whole gamut of of chemistry courses we have, everything from Chem One Hundred One, which is Intro Chem, through Chem One, Chem Two, and Organic Chemistry, and do a little bit of everything. So, carbon is this essential building block um, of of life. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. I like to say that most of our universe is decided by the arrangements of electrons in the outer shells of atoms. So, carbon, for instance, right? The reason why it's such an important building block is because it, it, it the availability and its valence electrons, and it has the ability to, to mix uh, and create more complex molecules. And there's uh, if you look at the column of a periodic table, you're in the same family. Family is a term? Yeah, family or group. Yeah. Family or group. And so the idea then is that it's possible that another element in that same group, like silicon, could also be a building block uh, for life in some other context. And that was actually uh, what HR, uh, H, what was I can't remember, HR Geiger used for aliens okay that these are silica but going outside of the sci-fi is that a reason is that a possibility could is it possible for other elements in that column to also be prominent building blocks i haven't okay so in terms of reading into that but when it comes to hypotheses with with silicon that it would be the one that would be most likely 
Uh, the one thing that makes carbon really unique in terms of non-metal elements and, and kind of why it builds a backbone is how much it bonds to itself. You get carbon chains. Um, and so you get carbon after carbon after carbon after carbon, and you get all this fun stuff around it. So there's all kinds of functionalities. What, you know, when we teach organic chemistry, we refer to it as functional groups. So you get alcohols, you get amines, you get carboxylic acids and all these fun things. So if you were looking for something similar to it, you would want to look below it. But silicons were kind of limited because silicons there. And then, and then what you get is those two are nonmetals. Then you drop down to where we call the semi-metals or the metalloids, and that would be germanium directly below it. And then that one, they actually made the first semiconductors from germanium. Uh, but that kind of lies in the middle, and it's much more rare. And then you get down to tin and lead, which are metallic, and they are almost completely different in how they bond. So you're almost limited to the two at the top, really, in terms of things that might, or silicon might be the one that would mimic carbon if you were looking at alternative life forms or something like that. I, I'm so glad I'm here for this conversation. Let me tell you something. We normally release this on Buzzsprout. We release it on Spotify with a little picture of our speaker. We're just going to release this one with a periodic table. Everybody's welcome. We're going to release it with a period. Anyway, I do want, because the way I was going to enter this conversation was to talk about your glorious mustache. That's that's where <laughs> I was going to enter. Uh, because we, I just got done seeing Top Gun and, my, oh, yeah. and Miles Teller sports a g gorgeous brushable mustache in that in that movie and, and my wife immediately grabs her shirt halfway through the movie Whoo! the second he walks on the screen and i've been talking with jared i've been consulting with jared as to whether i need to go full mustache but you, what is this a long time look of yours it's only been about the last two years and it was kind of serendipitous mm -hmm. uh so <laughs> i i enjoy making elaborate halloween costumes and i i built my own from scratch using a uh, a paint Paint overalls. I built a Dale Earnhardt costume, uh, costume, so full-on racing suit, and then cut my beard down to a mustache. Loved it so much that I have kept it ever since. You know, <laughs> I so would. I did guessed, it for Dale. I, I did would, it for Dale. I would have guessed uh, Lieutenant Dangle. From well, and tell, tell them who you were last year. Oh, I did Randy Macho Man Savage <laughs> so, last very year. well too. <laughs> All right. Well, you're giving me some inspiration right now. I appreciate that. So, by the way, what are can I, we just re kind of meld in what you're talking about now with the greater universe uh when you are looking at i assume you have been tracking the james webb i've i've seen some of the the great pictures and yes what is your feedback what are your reactions as somebody in your field it's it's really interesting because you know it's it ties so much into obviously you've already mentioned a lot of the physics of that um in in terms of how it ties into what what i would discuss as a chemistry instructor is one of the things that we talk about is, well, where did the elements come from? You know, where, 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 did, where did they, how did they end up on Earth? Where do they, a lot, like there are stellar forges that in stars right now, that, that in the immense pressure that's going on, that fusion is occurring and you're smashing those things together. And so when I see all those kind of pictures of, you know, the old universe and how things are maybe exploding out or all that different stuff and how all that the matter that makes things up is being thrown throughout the universe to conglomerate into planets and to a new stars and all that other stuff. That's where, that's where it hits me as a, as a chemist, you know, it's not so much the, you know, the time frame or the big bang or anything like that, but just seeing that those elements there that we're seeing those old stars, those old kind of pictures looking back into time and understanding that that coming out, like, Oh yeah, those elements they're they're still here. They're being recycled. They're being be, like basically changed in, into new forms and stuff. It's uh fascinating. Yeah, yeah, the furnace of uh, the, the you would say the furnace of creation. I mean, they're they're the 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 is are it's a fusion that you said a moment yeah, ago? So, the fusion yeah, that they're creating. Yeah, so they're like building a, the building blocks for galaxies, for atmosphere, for potentially life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah, especially when it comes to like, well, I was what I was mentioning was like uh, what we call stellar nucleosynthesis. The idea that in inside a star, there's so much pressure that you can, and where a star's energy comes from is basically burning smaller elements. So you burn something like hydrogen, and it, by burning, it forces them together in a way that it turns it into helium, and oh, that releases a ton of energy. And they just keep doing that until basically the energy doesn't work anymore. Like you can't, you can push them together.
fantastic. And one thing they mentioned on a space station that they've created on the moon was that, watch out for that aisle. That's where the chemists are. They're a little weird. I think it's because they don't go outside. That's what they're talking about. And every time, chemists are weirdos. You guys are all weirdos. I say that with nothing but pure affection because you guys know so much about something that it's almost like a Pandora's box. Once you know this stuff, it just alt- it co- it's got to completely alter your perceptions of the world, perceptions of interactions, perceptions of how we are. It changes things. Mm-hmm. Like I, I mentioned to my students very frequently when they, they take my course, especially when they start out, that one of the things I think one of the biggest hurdles in terms of understanding chemistry is it's something that we don't think about every single day. Like you don't because you can't see an atom, you can't. Like whereas when we think about our biology, like you can see how you know if you get a scratch, how it's going to affect your body. Like if if you get sick, you know you know what's what's happening. You're coughing up that phlegm, like you, that's there, you know. And but you can't see an atom. And so once you're kind of like, oh yeah, so this this process by which we're going to take this iron and this oxygen and it's going to rust, and I can predict what that's going to look like because I know how those things interact and based on how many electrons they have and what what those elements like to do like okay you know it it does change that perspective like it's not and it's predictable like you you kind of you can plan like you can say if i mix this and this in the right proportions i know i can make this in a certain amount and i can adjust my conditions to try to make it better like it it does very much change your perspective on in like i don't know in terms of how how you perceive the world around you. That was a big selling point for me too, right? The idea, it, it kind of clicked for me that it's all in our head, right? Like the, the, these models that we're using were imagined and created in our heads long before we ever had any kind of tools that could actually show evidence besides the fact that we can make predictions and get results, right? Oh, yeah. It's So the modern atomic theory, which is accredited to John Dalton around the year 1800, and so we teach that in, you know, first chemistry course. But the thing I always, and I, and I try to drill this point home, is that they were able to predict that atoms existed. And the, the term atom is actually Greek, and it goes back, I think, to Democritus, even in ancient Greece, mm-hmm. this idea that there were tiny pieces that we couldn't see that make up the world around us. And so the part I try to point out is, like, imagine that you're John Dalton. You've never seen an atom, right? What, have, what's, what's, what era is John Dalton? Yeah, around 1800 or so. Um, he's never seen an atom. All he has is a series of kind of scientific laws and observations that exist. Like, hey, Antoine Lavoisier has kind of discovered the law of conservation of mass, that when you have a chemical reaction, matter isn't created or destroyed. You know, other scientists were working on things like the law of definite proportions, that if you have a certain molecule like water, that it's always two hydrogens and one oxygen. Water molecule always is that way, that... You can't have half atoms combined. Like, there's no such thing as H2 and a half and O1. It's always whole atoms. And so Dalton comes along and says things like, all right, if that's the case, I think there are pieces that we can't see and they're indestructible, right? I think these pieces that we have around us, that they must be consistent. So when you have an element, it must be the same type of atom every time that they must combine in whole number ratios every time. And so he set out this framework a hundred years before they would even discover the electron, 150 years more or 160 or so before they would discover the electron microscope to actually begin to see the surface of what an atom looked like. So creating this framework from observation like that, it blows my mind every time I see like to, to get to that point and to have a kind of respect for that. How, how you can create those those theories, those those frames to explain the world without having the technology that we have today, where we can just go, yeah, there there it is. Like we have these cool electron microscopes, we can see it. You know, we can manipulate those atoms. Like it's and, and to, and to feed back into a point that I had raised earlier, I think once you have an intimate understanding of chemistry, like many of you crazy guys do, it just it does it does. Skew is the wrong word, but it um, course corrects how you see the world around you, uh, just an elemental level, of course, but also I think socially and how I don't know how our our regular human ignorance 
on chemistry doesn't drive all of you crazy. And it, maybe it has to a certain degree, and that's why you guys are the way you are. But I think about that, like, several subjects do that. Political science, which is what I teach. Mm-hmm. Oh, and speaking I, of, I watched a program, and they were like, oh, look at all those weirdo political scientists. <laughs> Watch out for them. They're always yelling. And I think it takes maybe weirdos to know a weirdo. <laughs> but there, when it comes to learning how uh, the government works, it's I think, and, and learning how politics operates, I think, um, my students, I hope, get the underst- walk out with a different observation of the universe than what they walked in from. Because we very easily, it is very easy for us to sit around and say, politi- how many politician and lawyer jokes have you heard in your life about how they're scumbags and how... Mm-hmm. Uh, but one thing we realize is that they are manifestations. They are manifestations, a little bit of the rules that are written, but they're also manifestations of who we are. Because if they stop acting the way that they act and they start acting more like normal humans, they stop getting elected <laughs> and because we are the driving force behind their behavior, as well as, of course, uh, tinkering, some of the tinkerings with the system as well. So I, 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 hope, I hope that that knowledge gives me a little bit of a different perspective and maybe makes me a little bit of a non, right, non-normal human and maybe a little bit of my students as well. But I definitely detect that, especially in the sciences, but very specifically in your field. Yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah, and you do. You made the joke about the. No, nobody ever really talks about the. Uh, I don't know. Mad the mad English teacher. Yeah, but, yeah. but there is very much. <laughs> so I had a. It was a fun. It was just a dumb kind of thing. I ended up in kind of a, a rabbit. You know, one of those weird <laughs> wiki holes uh, online. I was playing uh, Arkham City when it came out, so the Batman game, and I just happened to like. There, I was introduced to a whole bunch of new villains. And so I'm like, I'm gonna learn. I'm gonna learn more about the Rogues Gallery. I want to go read. And yeah. as I'm reading through it, the number of Batman villains who have chemistry in their background is <laughs> wild. So I like to tell my students on the first who day of class, like, who has chemistry in their who what? has chemistry in their background? Oh, uh, they, well, you know, you have. Uh, she's a botanist, but she's also really good with manipulating. So poison, poison ivy. ivy's oh, got chemistry. Uh, what about all the drugs and things that Jonathan Crane, Scarecrow, uses? Uh, and then the Mad Hatter has a bunch of stuff associated with that. And that's not even getting into like the minor, <laughs> minor ones. Yeah. Like, but yeah, it's. How about that? And you so, were always telling your students something about that? Oh, yeah. That if they want to get into super villainy, this is where it starts, <laughs> right? In, however, in my class. However, Two Face political science degree. <laughs> that's right. That is, that is true. But he did fall into a chemical vat, so. <laughs> that's bad. A lot of those guys in Batman, uh, uh, the, the reason why they are bad guys is they've, hey, they've corrupted the, the political system there. Falcone is the obvious example. Mm-hmm. Penguin is, depending on your version of Penguin that you've run across, is a different version. Uh, you got a little bit of that with Bane in the movies, uh, with the movies, and, and depending on which Bane movie you saw, but uh, in, in the cartoons, a little bit different. I want the first two Tim Burton, Danny DeVito, Penguin back. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's I, have you seen the more recent Batman? He, oh, yeah. He's played by, yeah. I forget his name, but uh, the, the Irish uh, actor. But very, I, I thought much more about the vampire movies. Yeah, Robert Pattinson, right? Robert Pattinson. Yeah. yeah I, haven't, I haven't seen it, but. The vampire movies. All right, so let's let's okay. We're way clearly, off track. You guys too buried in your science to come up for air and bury yourself in the twi- twilight stuff like I have over time. Uh, anyway, so th- that is interesting that th- that this could be their origin story to become a, a villain mm-hmm. as well. And usually, you, when chemistry is depicted, and maybe that's the difference between the crazy English teacher who doesn't exist. We never talk about a crazy English teacher. We talk about our cra- our amazingly passionate English teacher who influenced all of our lives it's who we always talk about but i don't know maybe it has to do with pop culture depictions of chemistry because but the only real pop culture chemi- i guess other than batman villains <laughs> would be like breaking bad and stuff like that yeah oh yeah when especially when i first started because it was right when breaking bad kind of hit and so it was sad, i don't want to say sadly but it was a lot of people's introduction to chemistry and like oh like so is that the case like did is that something they teach you? You know, do they, like you learn how to make drugs? Like, no, 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 not unless you're like <laughs> you're a pharmacologist or you're working on pharmaceutical chemistry. No, uh, but but it did. I think there's also. I also just thought of something because I don't ever watch those police procedurals. They always have chemistry people. But yes, they're they always do. people in labs and they're weirdos too. Yeah, but and, and the one thing that frustrates me about pop culture representations of chemistry and I guess more or less science in general Mm. is that it either greatly oversimplifies what we do or makes it seem much more wild in, in, in reality. Like, like, Oh yeah, look at all these 
like flasks with all these colored liquids and smoke rising out of the top of it. And I, and I tell my students, like, a lot of times if you see that, that's food coloring. <laughs> and they drop dry ice in it to create the, the, the smoke. Because yeah. if I see that, that would be in a fume hood <laughs> because that's probably poisonous. <laughs> and I worked in biochemistry, which meant everything I worked with was pretty much clear. Like unless yeah. it was a specific protein or something that, ha- that happened to absorb in the visible range, everything was clear. So it's just clear liquids and... I should have brought this yeah. up. We had an episode not that long ago with Kelly Miller. I should have brought this up with her, but because uh, she teaches psychology, my favorite science depictions on those police procedurals are always the uh, criminal psychologists, the people who kind of gather the evidence and then tell they paint a picture of who the criminal is, and they use a bunch of stuff that there's just no conceivable way that anybody could gather this. He'll walk around. And he'll say, uh, uh, that, "What? What? I forget what show it is. Just name your show." And the guy's like, "Well, this criminal here, he has issues." with society but he also has issues with himself and he wants you to know these things and here's how we know and it's just a bunch of like little slivers of absolutely no information he's using it to paint these elaborate pictures so it, it, that is true and you never see them use an eye wash station either in uh, no <laughs> never <laughs> once so this yeah. is why i would also argue for the importance of a liberal arts education because i think that's really the dividing line sometimes with chemists and physics not going into super villainy that's true. We yeah. need that influence yeah. of humanities you that and modulation. ethics, right? You're absolutely correct. <laughs> so something that we like to ask our guests to get to know them better um, as well is uh, tell us a, a, a hero of yours, someone you look up to, someone that you would like the audience to know more about. So I, I, I was actually, I listened to an episode of the podcast yesterday just to kind of get a feel for kind of where I was coming. And I heard that question and I had to really think about it. Um, and the more I thought about it, and I, I, don't, I didn't have like one person, but I'm very thankful for some of my teachers, especially early on, because they caught on to the fact that uh, that was bored. Um, and so I, I, the first time I remember it happening, and, I, and at the time, I didn't, it didn't register with me because I was like seven years old, but I think it was my first grade instructor, Miss Gray in Wisconsin, and I was getting done with my work incredibly early because my mom had taught me to read when I was like three and I had already, I was already working on math and stuff and I was way past. So I would get done with my homework and I was causing disruptions because I was done. And so I was just like looking for something to do. And I'm forever thankful because probably I could have been put in detention or, you know, been put in timeout. And she recognized like, nope, he's doing everything. He's doing all his work. So what she did was set me up and somebody would come by the class and they would come take me to the library and I got to do like cryptograms and do all kinds of puzzles, which got me into like, and I still do crossword puzzles even to this day, but they caught on to that. Um, and I, same thing happened when I moved to Missouri. Uh, I got, I got into the, my, my mom advocated for it, but got me into the gifted program at our, our elementary school, which got me one day a week out and to, like I said, do things like that. So I, I think of Miss Gray, uh, Miss Haas, Miss Manning, who they, they were able to like give me those extra things that I really think developed me at that early age and kind of encourage encourage that in, you know inquis you know inquisitiveness and and also getting a chance to kind of do some abstract thinking. It's you know in first grade versus like oh yeah you know you you're just gonna do more you're gonna add nine plus nine another time like I I got this <laughs> like. Were there teachers that steered you towards your field, or is that something that just kind of naturally happened for you? As <laughs> how, a puzzle, how as I, a, I would imagine chemistry is a great it, field it really for a is. puzzle guy. I, I initially I was very much a math person. I thought I was going to major in math or some of some sort. Um, and then you know I got to college and I really didn't have a plan um, at all. Uh, I was like, well, I I have good grades. I guess people with good grades go to med school. So I, uh, that was my original plan. I was going to go to med school. And I just happened to be dating a girl at the time who her dad was a doctor and had majored in chemistry. I was like, oh, I can major in chemistry. I don't have to do biology because I prefer chemistry quite a bit. And I went, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And the more I got into the lab and having a chance to do more upper level kind of experiment experiments and going there, it's like, I think I'm going to, I'm going to stick here. I'm going to, I'm going to continue to do chemistry. And that's what really kind of steered me that direction. I didn't have anybody specific in, in high school or anything like that, but it was just one of those things where just little things along the way, kind of, like I said, working with that, you know, my creativity and just kind of like, Oh, playing with puzzles and, and very much chemistry is a puzzle. There's so many things and little pieces that you can, 
rearrange and I build complex molecules and stuff like that to interact with an active site, you know, and, and, and it's, there's just so much stuff like that. But yeah, I, I think of all those, those teachers along the way, and it's, I know it's not a hero, but I, it's, I, it, I, they deserve credit because they, like I said, they picked up on those things. Like I, it, the number of times the teachers can see that and like, they just know it's like that person, no, they need extra time or they, they, they need something else to stimulate them because they, they had that it will help. That's credit to yourself as well for keeping your antenna up. Should some, should, a uh, should, a uh, should a uh, broadcast cross your antenna? That's like, wait a minute. That's something I think I'd rather tune into. And that's, that would be going back to uh, something that Jared mentioned earlier would be my defense of a liberal arts mm-hmm. education is <clears throat> doing so is I, we've just lived through a pandemic where a science illiterate community had no idea how to do with COVID-19. So really that's the argument. That is mm-hmm. the argument. But aside from that, Going, t- taking these general area classes, they are just opportunities for the people who keep their antenna up mm-hmm. to learn about a field adjacent to what they're doing, or maybe a completely different field. And we all deserve to have that opportunity to keep our antenna up, to see if there's a, an interesting opportunity, see if there's something that kind of pursuing a field that you're passionate about is going to make you way happier and probably more successful, I would guess, than a career you kind of slouch into. Mm-hmm. And and I you brought you bring up a really great point about like the liberal arts education. One of my and one of the reasons I think that I became a teacher, specifically at a college campus, is I lo- I love the process of learning, learning just to learn. I love learning new things, and my, I I tell my students this constantly. Like, hey, I know you're most of you are in this class. You are on the science track. Let me tell you some of my favorite courses was taking mythology with Dr. Nugent over at Missouri State. God, that was my favorite yeah, class like, at Truman she, State. She was yeah. so passionate and such a great teacher. Like I made a point because I met her when I came over for a scholarship interview when I was when I was in high school. I met her and I was like, this person's awesome. I don't care what, what area it's in. I'm going to take a course with, uh, with her. And I did. And it was fantastic. Like it was, you know, looking at you know, kind of the notions of, of humor, uh, hubris and xenophobia and all these different things that they had addressed within their mythology and, and how they, they dealt with the world around them. And it was, you know, being able to take things like that, but also, you know, tying it into, you know, to history courses and all these different things. Like I just, I love learning just for the act of learning and trying to, you know, now that I am that instructor, like trying to instill that. It's like, listen, I know you have goals and we want to reach those goals, but sometimes it's just fun to learn new things. And even though it's like, oh, are you going to use this when you're in your job? Maybe not, but the the critical thinking, the the that kind of process, I, I guarantee you're going to use that. Yeah. Like, and, it, and that's important. It really, those mythology classes really deepened, uh, first of all, how much I assume you're talking about Greek mythology. It was it was it was it was titled Classical Mythology was the course, but it went into Sumerian. So okay. we did Gilgamesh, we did Greek and Roman, um, and I, I can't remember if we got into any of uh, like uh, like some of the other stuff and uh, and more in Asia. But we focused mainly on Greek, Roman, and then some of the stuff that was in Sumerian. I, I, mine was Greek specifically, and I, I can understand from people who might say, "Okay, well, what, what are you doing now? How much does that have to do with Greek mythology?" And I, I just don't think, I think they missed the mark some because that class has deepened my appreciation for life. I, I've made no bones about the fact that I'm a religious person. But <clears throat> the fact that Greek mythology is teaching history the way Greeks would teach history. Their stories weren't just like this guy went here and he did that. Everything had a purpose, had a reason. It was selling you on it. Uh, I'm a religious person and um, I, I read that uh, Greek mythology and I recognize it in my own uh, Christianity is that these stories and like especially early Old Testament they all have purposes they're all telling you a story specifically to sell a point to you not so much here's strict up and down you know yeah. uh, 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 factoids they're, we're giving you a story so that you walk away with something from it and um, that that has informed me and I don't mean to upset any of our listeners who may take that stuff far more strictly than I, I now do but I, I it has deepened my appreciation for what my religion was trying to tell me mm-hmm. Just that idea of, of learning to use narrative, I think, is really important in teaching yes. and even in the sciences, right? When we when we talk about concepts, they're very much intertwined and we tend to, you know, string together this narrative of concepts and, and, and use a lot of times the history that, you know, learning to, to develop them the way that the people that created them 
connected, right? And yeah, the story is important. Like half the fun of science is like seeing that thread. Like you can mm-hmm. you can follow the threads. I, I'm so sorry. Can you make? Uh, this is a guy who's not in your field. Can you make narratives out of chemistry? I I try my best to. Yeah. I, I I try to tie a story and even design the class in a way that we start kind of like. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Like, yeah. what do we know? Okay, let's start with the smallest things first. Let's start with atoms. Yeah. Right? So, we, okay, we have this understanding of atoms. So let's build upon that. Yeah. Like, and so you can kind of watch as you start to build from one piece to the next piece. Okay, now we've got bigger molecules. Now what happens to those molecules start banging into each other and making right. new ones? Okay, now how do we, can we describe that? Or even, and like for me, because I'm, I'm kind of a, a history nerd too, like I love looking at scientific history and seeing like okay like this person discovered this here and then we can see okay once that was discovered all right you can see where the next part is like just to give a quick example when when like Marie Curie and Baccarel discovered radioactivity all right so they discover radioactivity and immediately once they understood there was the ejection of particles the number of scientists who went and holds like that's awesome we're gonna fire these particles at other particles and see what happens (laughs) and like they just immediately, like, they recognize the power in it. So now they're firing them off into it and then realize, like, oh, these atoms, right, that we, like, we think of like spheres, these, most of these particles go straight through them. Like, they're essentially empty space. And so you have this, and then they realize that, oh, you have this nucleus. Like, all, almost all the mass is in this dense area right in the middle of your atom, but most of it, where the electrons are, is just empty, you yeah. know? And, but that it's that you can't learn that part until you knew you had radioactivity, you know, and that type of thing. That's so it's, fascinating. And yeah. I read this, this podcast does not count as workforce development for anybody who might be listening to it. But if there was a piece of advice about instructing that we could impart, I share it with you. I think you need to have the narrative that sells the information because I just think it, we talked about this with, we had Dr. Higdon on at one point, mm-hmm. believe it or not that I just think that lodges in your head longer because we are storytelling beasts. I think that's what we do stories, more than stories remember. matter. Yeah. Like they really do. And if you, and it's, it's taken a lot of practice. Like I said, it's 13 years of practice at it. And like you really, even the more that I talk about it, the more I even recognize like, ooh, like how, how those, how those pieces, how those, they're all interconnected and you can tie that piece from the past into this, or you can tie this point into here. Like you can create those stories to kind of get them from one place to another. And here's a nice tile, Lupus, all the way back to the beginning. If you look at those pictures from the James Webb Telescope, what do you notice there's more of than anything else in the universe? Space. Empty space. Yeah. And then if we look down to the atom, there's more. What is there more of than anything else in an atom? Empty space. Like there's this beautiful symmetry and connectivity that just runs through. So that this, you know, c- keeping that narrative and, and sparking imagination. I think it's just crucial to to, to interest and, and motivation, right? Why do I want to know this? Why why do I ask this question? Fantastic. So uh, if we're if we're really going to get into the meat of things and ask the important questions, I think it's time for the most important, uh, which is Gumby versus Mister Ed battle to the death. From a chemist's perspective, who wins and why? Okay, from can a chemist's de- perspective, can we determine the chemical composition? Of, I, do you observe, do you almost, observe him I'm, and recognize him in chemistry? So I worry that Gumby is made of some sort of particle that it, we have not identified yet. Oh. Like if we look at the standard model of physics, because he is passing through walls, I yeah, believe, came up in one yeah. of these episodes. Mm-hmm. I, I like said, yeah, he's he's wild. Uh, but I, I worry that Mr. Ed could talk him to death. Like I really, you know, it's that country fried, you know, Mister Ed kind of going along it, and he also has Wilbur as a sidekick. If we flip it around, he there. does. So if we could include Wilbur, help. then he'd yeah. But then also that brings in Pokey, so I don't. Yeah, yeah that's very true. I didn't well, really commit to anything there, did I? I no, no, you didn't. No, a lot of Mr. a lot Ed. of people have talked about you know the the attack versus defense and 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 Mister Ed biting or you know eating Gumby, but what if Gumby's toxic? Yeah. Now. We're talking 1950s era claymation, right? And yes. I don't, I don't know if they've had done any work on that, but yeah, I don't know if there are any issues. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, 
you you think that maybe they could do a an instant? Are you a Marvel fan? And and Martin go TV show WandaVision, Vision fights another Vision, mm-hmm. and and halfway through the battle, they're like, "What are we doing here? Let's just settle our differences and talk this out." I could see like obviously this is something a couple of our people have tried to escape through. Like I think Gumby and Mister Ed are nice; they can talk out their differences. We're we're taking that out of the equation here, so I don't accept that Mister Ed has the ability. To reason Gumby down into, I mean, in your head, how do you see that playing out? He could talk Gumby to death? Well, I, I feel like Mr. Ed would probably get him to parlay, you know, he would, he, he would, he would, like, uh, strange social rules, like, he, he probably knows, what, what is it, what, is, whose rules of order, you know, he, he's probably worked on that. No, we have, and now he's lost. He has a little horse briefcase yeah, and he pulls out paperwork. Yeah, absolutely, like, he's, we he's have, been listening, he's been training for this. We have established over the course of this podcast that Gumby is probably operating with what we're guessing is elementary level intellect. Elementary I don't school. think I've ever conceded to that. Do you think he's operating on higher planes than he's revealed? Uh, well, I mean, wh- what are you going off of? Uh, his interactions, his entire conversation is, well, that's swell. He just talks very monosyllabic and very el- elementary. School. I don't think kindness is a, is necessarily a good way to judge someone's intelligence. In fact, I would it's suggest a great the opposite. To, it's a great way to judge their ability. To, although I'm arguing against myself here, it's a great way to argue their, their lethality. In yeah. Um, but I, that w- I do think that probably the biggest thing you have going against him is I do think you could probably talk circles around him just because, I mean, I, I have to... I, I'm engaged right now. Before I left here, I was engaged with uh, negotiations with a four-year-old. It's not hard to get them to argue against themselves. So I do worry about Gumby in that regard. But I do think the second Gumby closes, bridges the gap, I think it's over. Yeah, I think it'd be something like convincing. Like I, I worry that Mr. Ed could convince Gumby that he doesn't exist. Like He could work him in a, a thing of logic to where he poofs out of the universe. Very similar to kind of what uh, happened in, uh, what is it, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think where, that... Yeah, I, I think God, that... God logics himself out of the universe. I think that might actually work against Mr. Ed. Because, again, I'm, I'm assuming Mr. Gumby is operating very basic levels here. And I recently had to talk to uh, my seven-year-old about what an interview is when you're interviewing for a job. And she was like, oh, so you're getting the job. Uh, no, we don't know that yet. So you're not getting the job? That's correct. You may still yet get the job. Okay. So you get the job after the interview? What happened? What are we doing here in an interview? I, I It blew my own mind trying to explain to a seven-year-old what an interview was. So I, I worry that that will work against Mr. Ed in the, Ed in the long run with the 15 million questions he'll be getting from Gumby. Mm-hmm. I can see that. But he is a horse, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. So we brought you here today um, to share with us a, a, a hobby that you have, uh, something you've been doing for a while, and I'd also like you um, to help uh, make that connection of of, of kind of how you relate it to your field and your other interests. Um, so tell us what you brought here today. Uh, yeah, so when I was talking to Jared, because we are office mates, um, and I was like, oh, what, what do you want to talk about? I was, I'll talk about coins. I enjoy coin collecting. And, and I, I again, it ties very much into my field. I'm like, yeah, let's pick something that really works in a non-visual medium. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I, I brought I brought coins with me for anybody who listens to this. Um, Have you, you ever described s- them? They're round. Yes. Have you ever put thought into why you collect things? Because if you look at every phase in my life, I collected basketball cards, then CDs, mm-hmm. then... Uh, there's been two or three phases of collecting in my life, and I have no idea why I'm so driven to collect. Oh, I wish I could remember where i read it but they were talking about like the the act of collecting and what it didn't matter what it was but it was just the act of kind of getting things and kind of completing sets and like i don't know i i've never been like i'm kind of chaotic in terms of how i go about the process but i just love the idea of completing a set um but this actually it started and uh kind of as an accident like i it was Weird, I was talking to a couple different people about this but before I was going to come on the podcast, and the number of people who have a coin story. Like, if, if I were to ask either of you, and uh, like, hey, do, do you have something in your family where somebody told you about a coin, or you ended up with a weird coin? Do either of you have that? Uh, do I have a weird coin? Yeah. I used to um, have one of those. My, when, I, when I was in, like, middle school, my dad got me a little paper a penny collector and it told you about different kinds of pennies some of them have d's on them some mm-hmm. of them have <clears throat> p's or s's they have different letters and you can kind of collect it and, and so that's kind of what i did and mm-hmm. across the way i ran across 
like a coin with a buffalo on it. I still don't know what that was, but it was really, really old is all I can tell you. I have some. You have some? Yes. What did I run across? Uh, you ran across a buffalo nickel. Buffalo nickel from what era? Uh, that is, they from were made from times? about uh, 1916 or so into the 1930s. Holy smokes. Yeah. Hmm. I often quote that line from No Country for Old Men when he's at the gas station, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I enjoy has it. been traveling. <laughs> but I, I really like the part at the end when he's like, don't put that in your pocket. If you do, it just becomes another coin, which it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then he leaves. Anyways, uh, but no, I do. I remember as a kid, uh, my... <laughs> that is a great poll. It's great. Uh, my... Um, my stepdad had been overseas and came back and given me some coins from overseas. And it, it hit me in that moment. Oh, not everybody does things the same way. And just kind of seeing it and having it in my hand, I was just fascinated by like the, you know, the, the how different they were in size and uh, color and, and what was on them and all that. Yes. My, my uh, grandfather, uh, my wife's grandfather, I'm sorry. A uh, great man. And he had an entire wall full of albums of and, um, stamps. And they were great to just flip the pages and look at. But you had to be very careful because you can't manhandle a stamp. Can you manhandle a coin, or do you prefer your coins to be untouched? I, I so so in the collecting fields, right? So people who are really like because I collect for the joy of collecting. I collect for the history and yeah. the fascination of it. So a lot of my coins are free, <laughs> uh, or or they're just in like little flaps, like the ones that you see here. Um, for those who are getting into the field and they're like they're collecting for investment purposes, like they're putting down some serious scratch to to get a hold of stuff, the coins are what we call slabbed. You send them to a third party grader. Um, so there's several different companies that will grade coins according to a, a system they use. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll basically slap them into kind of a plastic or a resin. And so it stays in there, and then you have these slabs that now have your coin that have a, a certain grade on it, and then that kind of sets like this is what it is. But I don't know. I just like the tactile experience of of feeling the weight of a coin. Like it, like I, I like to I, I I'm careful with it. Like so when I when I do hold a coin, I you you should hold it around the edges, right? And, and like in your fingers. Like if you do hold a free coin, you don't want to grab the faces of it because the oils from our hands. Now that gets into the chemistry. The oil from our hand will get onto the coin, and that can help you know speed up the process of corrosion and different things like that. But but yeah, I I, I just I like the history of it. I like feeling that. And so you know, putting it in. Putting in a slab just seems so sanitized, and I, it's just not something that I'm particularly interested in. I was the same doing. way with basketball cards because they were always I didn't I didn't even know what mint condition meant. I was so young, and then I went to a card store, and they were like, "Well, that card's like twenty five bucks." I was like, "I don't have twenty five, but why is that? I have that back at home. Mm-hmm. I want it again for some reason because I was mental, I guess." And he was like, "Because it's in mint condition, people don't uh, touch it." I'm like, "Wait a minute, people collect cards." And they don't touch them and pull them out and look at the stats on the back and look at the cool pictures. Some of them are the uh, hologram ones you can kind of move around. So yeah, so I just don't understand how those people have the discipline to do that. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand it either. But it's, it's interesting. Like I don't know. Do, like I have, I have a few that I brought with me. Um, I don't have many. I, like I have, a, it's a small-ish collection. I have certain things that I've nearly completed. Like I've nearly completed the full Lincoln cent set. Like, I have almost everything from 1909, which is the first time the Lincoln set was made, all the way up till, I think my my sheet goes up to, like, 2015. There's, like, one or two that I might be missing, and one of them is incredibly rare, so it's very tough to get. Um, Where do you get them? I've... So when you I don't first, just ask for change at the gas station, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, but I, I, del- I do keep, you know, so usually some, some cash around occasionally. Like, if I get cash, I don't... I, I keep it so I get change because I'd like to look through it and yeah. see if I, anything fun fun pops up. Um, but that's where I started was just change that I had. Like I had a big bucket. So where where this process started as an adult, I had a giant bucket of change. And I was like, you know, one day I was like, I need to put this into coin rolls. I'm sick and tired of I, I, Let's just do it and get it in the bank. And I was going through it and I'm like, wait a second. I've got a lot, a lot more than I thought. And so I was like, you know what? Let's see if I can make a set. So I started playing around with it and I was... And I was trying to, I think, make the state's quarter set because it 
you know, for a lot of people my age who got, you know, kind of into collecting, that was a big thing because it gave something new that was came out when I was a kid. Like, oh, you could start collecting these. So I started going through and checking the states. And then I went start and went through and started checking my my dimes and my my nickels and my pennies and seeing what I had. And then from there, then it's like then I was in the rabbit hole. Like now it's like, OK, now I want to know more. Let's see what else I can find. So I went to the bank and as I I went and took some money and turned it into coin rolls and took them home and went coin roll hunting, just kind of looking and see what I could find. And but now, like sometimes uh, I've been to coin shows like they have a, a fairly large o, uh, the Ozark Coin Club has a fairly large coin show that they do out at the uh, fairgrounds once a year, usually. Uh, I've been into a few coin shops and different things when I go on vacation. Like I love going into coin shops in different states and stuff. Uh, one of my favorite coins, I think it's this one. Yeah, so I have a, it, this is an Eagle Head Scent uh, that I have here that I bought in Cleveland uh, when I went to visit Ohio a couple of years ago. Um, but so the Indian Head Scent is actually the, or no, excuse me, this is the Flying Eagle Scent. Uh, the Flying Eagle Scent is the first scent or penny. Um, technically, it's a cent piece. There's no such thing as a penny uh, in, in American money. Uh, that, the penny is also very similar in size to what the English coin was. So we call them pennies, but they're actually cent pieces. But in this one, so this is the first coin. So before uh, these were started to be made, which is in 1856, there were two types of cents. There was a large cent, which was a fairly large piece that was almost the size of like a silver dollar. And then a half cent, which was more similar to the size of our penny. But then starting in around 1856, they made these for only two years. Uh, they made them in like 1857 and 1858. They made flying eagle cents. And I got one from my parents one year for Christmas. They happened to find it at a thrift store. And I was like, I've got to get another one of these. It's one of my favorite coins, I, if you want to kind of look at it. But so this at its time was worth one cent. One cent. It was, it was a one cent piece. They, they caught away from half, half denominations because things were now worth enough. You didn't have to have half cents anymore. But that one, I, it's, it's neat because they only made it for two years. What they decided was, I guess, with the technology of the time that they were using for minting, they couldn't consistently get the eagle to show up properly. Because they were, they were, they just couldn't get the the presses to work right, and so they went then to the Indian head cents for the next fifty years before the Lincoln cent. There's a coin. This is 1857. Yeah, 18. Uh, yeah, penny from 1857. And so you're also saying that we took the term penny from the English, and yeah. that there is actually nothing yeah, called a penny. Any, if you look, it at also any, says one cent. This it also coin. says one cent. Yeah. So any huh. coin, they'll always say one cent on them. This coin I am holding is older than the Republican Party. This FYI, that's an old coin, my yeah, friend. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was thinking about that the other day when I pulled that out. It's like that coin was being handled by somebody before the Civil War. Like it, it was Although that person buy, probably had your mustache, yeah, could possibly <laughs> they could have, but th that's that's what really t like it fascinates me the history of where some of the coins come from and the designs. Um, so my one of my favorite stories about certain coins is so in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds they had what are called the barber set. So there were uh, mo mainly mainly nickels. Di I think no, excuse me, dimes, quarters, and like half dollars. They were called barber coins. And they were all just a very basic depiction of liberty and a very kind of simple shield on one side of the coin, on the reverse and obverse. Well, Teddy Roosevelt became president and he looked at the money and says, This is garbage. Look at look at look at over in Europe. Their money looks awesome. We can do better. And so he basically asked some of our best sculptors, like, I want you to come up with better coins, right? See what you can come up with. And uh, they did. So the, the, there are three main coins that were made that were in the kind of circulation denominations. Uh, there was the Mercury Dime, um, and then there's what's called the Standing Liberty Quarter and the Walking Liberty, uh, or, and the Walking Liberty Half Dollar. Uh, the Walking Liberty Half Dollar is my favorite coin in the in the uh, U.S. set. It's it's beautiful. I have one. Uh, I'll I'll move it around and show you because you can't see both sides of it. I've always uh, loved the half dollars anyways because they're they're big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the one thing about this one, like if you hold it in your hand, is the sheer weight of it. Mm. Like that's the part that's fascinating to me. Like if you compare it to like a modern coin, it, it's it's just so big. Mm. Um but yeah, like it's it's a depiction. This one here is it's had it has a depiction of liberty walking across 
uh, uh, walking across the way and there's a flag waving in the background and like Roosevelt wanted artistic coins and very much they are like the eagle representation on this it's like got its wings flared out and it it's just it's very very neat but it's beats the pants off the JFK half dollar which was really just it's a just, bust of his head yeah and so it was it, I think the first I think the Lincoln cent is the first coin that honored a president or somebody else that was that was on one of our circulation things. Like that's the first one. And then slowly but surely every single coin went away from neat depictions of liberty or other things. And then they became like, okay, here's the Washington quarter. You have the Jefferson nickel, you have the Roosevelt dime or the, you know, the, the, the uh, Kennedy half dollar. And, and I don't know, there's just something neat about looking back into the past and like seeing like, Oh, this is a completely different depiction. Like where they were, they were like Liberty and just different depictions of what, what would, what was what was on Liberty's head? Did they have a crown? Did they were they wearing a you know the, a different kind of hat or in like and so that's how a lot of the coins are named. Like this is the uh, seated Liberty coin. This is the standing Liberty. This is the uh, Liberty with you know with the little they're carrying around a little hat on it. Um, but it's but it's really like I said it's very fascinating like a lot of the history and things that go along with it and that's the part that really piques my interest a lot. It's I like collecting. I like getting a hold of them, but the story, again, I, I know I've already said it several times, but stories mean so much. And like, there's just so many cool stories in the history of like, why certain, why do certain coins exist? Why are there so many silver dollars? Like why, you know, why, you know, why are certain coins very popular? Why are the ones not? It's, it's kind of An Another thing that seemed like heresy to me would have been the notion of reselling. Although, have you done any coin reselling? I've never, I've never resold one. Me, I mean either. I, I have I, a gigantic bucket still in my attic of mm -hmm. CDs I never use, and it just feels like a part of me. It doesn't feel right to sell yeah. them off. Plus, half of them are probably busted anyway. Yeah, I, I, I have a, I know where I got most of these. Like, I, I know mentally. Like again, where. I know almost what what day I got them. I, I I can tie them to a place in time. Like I like the one I just showed you, the Flying Eagle scent. I got that in in Cleveland, Ohio. We were staying in a really cool hotel on a vacation, and it had this like op like atrium area, little mall that was attached to the hotel. So I happened to be walking through, and lo and behold, there was a coin shop, and I I bought that one there. Like I have another one over here that I know I bought that one on my birthday. I went down to Nixa to a coin shop. It was the only one open on my birthday on a Saturday. It's like, I'm going down yeah. and getting a coin. I want one. I, um, you know, I, when I was in elementary school, I collected uh, soda cans and <laughs> I think that's, I think that's why I was, because I was having a nice little day with my mom and she got me this chestnut soda and I'll rinse it out when I'm done with it. Now I can just think of that time uh, until eventually that, I started overtaking my room and I had to make some judgment <laughs> calls about my about my yeah. space management. Yeah. I had a stuffed animal collection when I was really young. And I remember in like junior high, I think the Goofy movie came out mm -hmm. and I had made some comment to a family member that I thought Goofy was funny. Mm -hmm. And it was about the same time the Disney store opened in the mall here in Springfield and Th that mistake led to the next like three Christmases. Everybody just bought me things with Goofy on them, so I had this Goofy collection without really like it didn't have one. Yeah, but my grandpa Durden was a avid collector, and like his basement, there were rooms just dedicated to different collections. So he had NASCAR collection, he had baseball cards, he had soda bottles like the real from the you know way way back old glass, rc cola old glass, old bottles, glass ones yeah. all those stuff some of them were full um i believe there was a trip to the hospital when i drank one once uh they're still full yeah see that's so, that's the the mint condition stuff that i yeah. just can't get behind. had a lot of stuff like that all yeah. his cars were you know, a lot or a lot of them anyways were mm -hmm. all were all mounted never opened things like that but um i had a weirder question so uh if we were to define money, I would define it as an abstraction of resources, right? It started, though, in this from, you know, if you go back far enough where you had gold and silver coins, where the coin itself, the metals had the value associated with the coin, right? Mm -hmm. When did that stop? I, I actually was reading about this a little bit before coming over here. Was it Nixon who took us off the gold standard? Uh, it's, it's I, I think officially, maybe, yeah, okay. but I... I Old before that, so and I did, I did not bring one of these with me, 
So there is a type of coin called the Morgan Silver Dollar and started being minted around 1878. So there was a, an act passed. It was called the Bland-Allison Act. And basically what it was is, is around the time, like in your poly political science. So do you talk about like the free silver movement or anything like that? Any uh, of the courses yeah, well, my political science starts entirely 1984. Okay. So, so occasionally it comes up the idea of William Jennings Bryan, the free silver movement and all this other stuff. Well, what they wanted was, is like at the time, apparently from what I read today, is that if you had gold, you could take it to a mint and they would make a coin and then it became, it was your coin. You'd pay a small little fee for them to make the coin, but that was yours. You could not do that with silver at that time so you couldn't make free silver like it wasn't free to do that and so a lot of the silver mine owners at the time were like well we have all this excess silver what are we going to do with it so they passed this act to basically say okay we're going to buy a boatload of silver from you right and we're going to turn it into coins right that way that you're making money because you have all this extra because they had discovered all these loads in nevada and different places out west that were producing tons of silver and so now they could build it. They, now they could put it into coins. You can get a little bit more money in circulation, which they were. Some of the the farmers were actually hoping for inflation at the time, so their crops cost more. But in reading, in getting back to your question, in reading about that today, one of the things they mentioned was is that the amount of silver in the coin was actually far less than the actual face value for a long time. There was not a bimetallic standard. So it wasn't until I think the 60s that the amount of silver that was in the coin surpassed what the value on it was. And now, now it's flipped where the silver is worth more than what the coins are. So that's why you never see a silver coin in circulation. Like, because they were, they essentially stopped being made, I think, in the late 60s. Like, there are no more silver coins besides like bullion coins and things like that that people get for investment purposes. Uh, but yeah, so for a time, the gold ones did have the right amount of gold, but the silver ones didn't for a long part because there is so much silver that we had um, that you it, and the size of the coins didn't match. So there was actually a time when the, the coin was worth more than the silver in it, which seems wild to think about in 2022. So a lot today all the way from the the biggest ideas in the universe and cosmos all the way down to the atom we've we've really worked the gamut here we have yeah uh, absolutely what's going on out in the universe and these giant from the things that connect all of us to the hobbies that isolate us in our bedrooms alone for <laughs> hours on end so from star forges to coins <laughs> uh we've learned a lot and and andrew i didn't know that i didn't know that either now you do Thank you so Thank much. You. Mm-hmm.